Good morning. Hello and welcome. How are you? Oh, what a gorgeous day. Get up. Actually, I don't. I suppose I'll have to put my wind up from the sound point of view. Here we go. Look at all that growth. It's May. May is the uh, time of year where you can lie down on the lawn and watch the grass grow in real time. Let's clean the windscreen up a bit. So anyway, I hope you're well. Let's turn the radio off. I'm going to put in two implants today. Same person. They've got uh, lower four to four and uh, no bone really distally to the five. So I'm going to put in a couple of implants in the five area and uh, sort of extend their occlusal table a bit on the basis that sort of 10 teeth in each jaw is, is about enough, you know, for appearance and for chewing and for speaking. It's the old Yorkshire rule of 10. It's my late father-in-law. Wouldn't bother, well, he would, but he would bother filling. Uh, he wouldn't bother uh, trying to save anything much behind the sixes. Certainly wouldn't root treat anything, wouldn't, wouldn't root treat a molar really. Uh, I'll never forget his face when uh, I was a dental student and uh, uh, he asked me, you know, what, what I would do about such and such, this and such and such of that and and I told him that I would, I would root treat a seven, I would root treat an upper left seven and he looked at me like I was mad, you know, like, you know, really, are they doing that now, root treating, root treating sevens, who ever heard of it? You know, he'd root treat a one or two and a three uh, or a five and that's probably about it. Anyway, now I was just going to say uh, a few other thoughts that had occurred to me following the uh, publication of this uh, Public Health England report on NHS dentistry. Uh, basically, you know, the headline was that there's a three-year waiting list and uh, everyone, everyone thinks that although it's only a couple of hundred pound for as much dentistry as you can, can swallow. Uh, it's still massively expensive and uh, fostering inequalities, you know, inequalities in access, etc, etc. This inequalities in access is a real, uh, it's a real problem, you know. I mean, I, uh, I went and sat in on a nice meeting at the uh, National Institute for Health and Clinical Excellence meeting. Uh, they, I think they were talking, uh, well they were certainly talking about dentistry, I forget what the exact subject was. But it was totally dominated by one person on the committee who was, uh, I think, a sociologist and not, not a dentist or anything to do with dentistry. But she totally dominated the proceedings by insisting that um, uh, there was an access inequality. And that it was up to the NHS to make sure that it was open to everyone who was entitled to receive it. And... Um, a particular uh, favourite um, ethnic group was uh, Romanian travellers, and uh, basically travellers in general. And she said that uh, travellers can't get access to dentistry, uh, basically because they, you know, they never stick around in one place long enough to get registered. Um, so. That dictated the whole policy, and the uh, you, know, you have to understand when you're discussing these things the difference between equality of opportunity and equality of outcome. Uh, equality of uh, outcome is what uh, people mistakenly campaign for, and it's not it's not something that you can achieve. You can't uh, make sure everybody has the same outcome. 
or, or uh, an equal outcome because um, you'd have to handicap some people whose outcome was better and, and uh, compensate people whose outcome was worse. Uh, and that's just not, technically it's just not possible. You know, you can't, you can't, uh, for example, I mean, some people are more intelligent than others. And you can't dumb down the people who are more intelligent and, and compensate the ones who are less intelligent. Um, give them more of what the intelligent people have got. Uh, and it's the same, there's no, uh, there can be no equality of outcome. Some people are lazy and prefer to live off the fruits of other people's work. Other people are industrious and uh, won't like to profit from their um, from their the fact that they're creating goods and services. Uh, you, you know, it's the old, uh, it's a sort of a very Marxist type uh, approach. Whereas uh, equality of opportunity is a different thing entirely. Sounds very similar, but. Basically, it means that everybody gets the same chance at an equality of an outcome. So, you know, you make sure that everybody has the... Uh, that the NHS, for example, is open to everybody. Um, and, uh, but, but you don't promise that it's going to do the same for everybody. Um, and they're frequently confused. And what this report was complaining about was that... Uh, there isn't equality of uh, equality of outcome, and it it's sort of crystallises a theme. One of, one of the facts that I found quite shocking, which was actually ad admitted in a sort of a proud way by the report, was that now I think 51% of uh, of the population now receives their NHS dentistry free, and they were sort of trumpeting in that and say, look, you know, don't don't uh, tell us that. Uh, 200, 300 pounds is a lot of money, uh, which I personally, I don't, I mean, I think that's blindingly, uh, ridiculously low uh, fee for the services that are provided. Without, without a considerable amount of government subsidy, you can't provide dentistry to the, the public uh, for, for two, 300 pounds, of course. Um, but their argument was that, you know, even for people, people who are on low incomes, um, get, get it, don't pay anyway. You know, this has always been their argument, you know, that uh, you don't complain that you have to pay to have your dentistry done. People who think that dentistry is a mainstream health service and should be part of the, a fully integrated part of the National Health Service will say... Um, it should be free of charge. Should be free at the point of delivery and funded indirectly out of uh, taxation, like the rest of healthcare. <coughs> the reason it isn't a lot is largely historical, um, and initially it was that was how it was done. It was free, but then what happened was that uh, uh, you know you can't, let's say have your appendix out and then go to another doctor and have your appendix out again to see if it's any better or and then the third doctor and have your appendix out again to see if he does a slightly better job than the first bloke whereas you can have a set of dentures made and then immediately have another set of dentures made and then another set of dentures made to see if, if the third set is better than the second set but it's better than the first set etc um, and so um, that's why charges were brought in uh, initially for dentures you know, because people were just going, going around doing the old health tourism bit and just having uh, multiple sets of dentures made at NHS expense. But um, so uh, yeah, so um, there's a sort of uh, an ancient. 50, uh, well it must be 70 years old now principle that uh, dentistry is not, uh, dentistry is chargeable because uh, to, to keep a cap on demand and you know and they've tried other ways as well the old uh, uh, what was it called? prior approval where if something was above a certain level say 300 quid or something you had to, the course of treatment if the fee was above 300 pounds you had to 
send off and get it rubber stamped by some clerk who look it up on a list of what's allowed and what wasn't allowed. It wasn't a clinical decision in any way at all. Um, possibly the people who drew up the, 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 the books of the tables as to what was allowed and what wasn't allowed sort of tried to convince themselves that they were doing it on some sort of clinical grounds but uh, in practice obviously every clinical case is different so uh, that really shouldn't it was a, it was a, it was a terrible abuse of uh, clinical privilege and it was perpetuated by a bunch of clerks in Eastbourne who turned down basically anything that was expensive uh, however irrespective of need <laughs> so now we've got a situation where um, the health service is still still justifying this uh, charge uh, in the face of uh, people uh, like my lady complaining about access um, by saying that if you're on it um, used to be income support but I suppose now it's universal credit that you're you get it free anyway and um, To have uh, more than half the people using the National Health Service now exempt or fully remitted charges, and exempt, uh, exempt, uh, there's, there's a slight difference. Exempt means that you, there is no charge to you. Uh, fully remitted means that there is technically a, there is a charge, but you are exempt from paying the charge. So therefore, it's the same thing. I mean, you still don't pay anything. But there is this, just in case you'll wonder why we always say exempt or fully remitted. It's because of this uh, distinction. Is, um, you know, and that figure surprised me because I thought that's funny because, you know, I don't ever remember it being that high. Uh, now, I always remember it being in the sort of the 20, 30% mark. And certainly when I worked in the health service, uh, you know, a lot of people were exempt or fully remitted, but um, no, it was never more than half, you know. And so that leads me to think that one of two things has happened. And it can only be one of two things. One is that uh, the population as a whole has got much less wealthy. In other words, far more people have been brought into the net of universal credit and therefore free dental treatment, free, free cod liver oil, free vitamins, you know, free childcare, whatever you get. Uh, or um, the vast majority of, or the, uh, the majority of people now who, who use the health service um, do so because they have no choice, because they are they have no money to do anything else. You know, they have no alternative. Where have all the fee-paying patients gone on the health service? That's what it all boils down to. Are they all uh, impoverished and broken and, and, and had to go on universal credit? Or how, are they choosing to either not attend the dentist or go elsewhere? Uh, and, and certainly we've got a lot of um, patients. I mean, we, we had five new patients yesterday. Five new patients yesterday. Now, we don't really keep track of uh, whether they've come from the NHS sector, but I think a large number of them have. Um, I'd say 50% of all our patients come here from NHS, formerly NHS practices. So what does that tell us about the service? Well, I think, um, what it tells me, having observed the service over that period of time, is that um, the government has succeeded, has succeeded in its objective, which was an unstated objective, but we always thought, it was a sort of a tacit objective, we always assumed that their objective was to make anyone who could afford to go privately, go privately. You know, was they, what they wanted to do was maintain this... Um, narrative that the National Health Service is for anybody and uh, uh, you know everybody and they have to do that because 
everybody pays national insurance. Everybody, we don't necessarily pay it, but everybody's liable for national insurance. Everybody. And so, if you're taking money off for someone, for, for you know, let's say whatever you're going to spend it on, whether it's on the armed forces or whatever, you can't say, well, we're going to we're going to tax everybody, and uh, we're going to set up an army, but the army is going to defend everywhere except Kent. Right? Kent is not going to be defended. And so obviously the good burgers of Kent will then uh, turn around and say, well, why are we paying income tax towards the army if we're not going to be a beneficiary <laughs> of the defence? And it's the same with uh, dentistry. You always get, you get people coming in and saying, no, I pay my national insurance, I pay my national insurance. You don't get it so much now, but I'm, I'm sure you still do on the National Health Service. Uh, with the, in the NHS practices where they come in and say I pay my national insurance I'm entitled to get this done on the National Health Service um, and to raise a tax like I mean it's called national insurance but it's just another it's another type of tax uh, but to raise a tax that, that is intended to pay for a universal benefit and then to say to certain classes you're excluded from this benefit um, it's not politically acceptable because it leads to resistance to uh, paying tax. So what you have to do is you have to maintain the veneer that everybody's entitled to this service. While at the same time, behind the scenes, try and uh, all, all these machinations to try and make sure that nobody can, um, you know, so, can so far as possible deter them from uh, taking advantage of this service. So how have they how have they done that? You know, how have they deterred people to the extent that the majority now are um, exempt? You know, which again would, would please my lady because she'd be like, well, yeah, you know, that's precisely what the service is for. Rich people, uh, she felt, should pay uh, tax uh, and for services which are are only available. Uh, to the poor um, and not complain you know and I must admit I've got a little bit of sympathy with that because there is the what I call the sort of there but for the grace of God you know I mean I uh, I am happy for my tax to be spent on services that I would not myself use okay uh, it's I always say no I wouldn't I don't think I'm ever going to need that. Say universal credit. I hope and pray I'm never ever going to need universal credit. But should circumstances arise that I need it, then I'm happy for it to be there for me if I was to be desperate. There but for the grace of God. <coughs> but it's one thing to say... Uh, Derek, you know, universal credit is there for you, um, should you should you need it. And another thing, to, it's a question of whether you need it or whether you want it, you know. I shouldn't be told that because I am in a certain group of people that uh, I, I, I am expected to pay towards universal credit, but I, I am not expected to ever get it, you know. It must be available to me. Um, and and that, so that's the line they're pursuing with the National Health Service. It's like, we'll never refuse you access, but just don't ever ask. So, uh, it's, uh, you know, on the face of it, it's this, the story is that it's universally available, but in practice, of course, it isn't. Uh, and it isn't because uh, there's not enough of it commissioned at a high enough price to um, encourage... Uh, encourage the sort of dentistry that is necessary to improve the oral health of the nation. It's just, dentistry is an expensive service to provide. There's no getting around that. There's no such thing as cheap dentistry. It, it, it requires this combination of uh, mental, um, academic skills, business skills, and manual skills that you, is very, very rare. Um, and therefore dentists are always were and really deserve to be in the sort of the top decile of earnings um, and if they're not then they'll they'll 
pick up their football and move elsewhere and that's what they've done they've moved into the private sector hence the shortage hence the fact that uh, the vast majority of people who used to go on the health service in the 80s when I was practicing when it was a it was a bloody good service um, you know and we had far fewer dentists far fewer practices and uh, we used to see and, and the quality of the work was far better than it ever was uh, and and you could go to a dentist anywhere you could walk in it you could just fall over in the high street and you'd hit your head on an NHS dentist there were several in every high street very very happy to take you on you know and do whatever was necessary to get you sorted out so <clears throat> On the one hand, I think you've got, uh, you know, the general uh, money printing and the government spending money like a, a drunken sailor has sort of reduced the spending power of people's currency to the point where there's much less, uh, there's less affluence. You know, I, I remember in the 80s when it, every mother came in and had every one of their children's teeth fissure sealed. And it wasn't, if it wasn't £10, it was £5 or something. Well, you're still talking about £40 for every single child. And um, it was just like a fad. Everyone had it done. Nowadays, there's no fissure sealing. You know, there's uh, a bit of a do dollop, a bit of fluoride varnish on, which God knows, you know, the main beneficiaries of that have been the people that make the Durafat varnish. I would say. So you've got an impoverished nation and a supply side constriction to the point where now they've got, you know, my, my lady's got the service that she wanted, which is basically just uh, a service which is only available to... Um, um, people who are exempt and by only available <clears throat> I mean the only service that they can use you know I mean how many points do you give the NHS for making available a service for people who, who have no money you know, I would not give them much credit for that because I think uh, <laughs> the cost of providing a service for people who have no money uh, far outweighs the amount of dentistry you could buy if you just got out of the business and let them keep the money and uh, make their own arrangements. You know, it's far more, it's far more, the NHS is a very, very inefficient way to provide dentistry uh, and it does it very badly. Yeah, she didn't know, did she, when she decided to buy a house in Sprackling Lane, that she was going to spend 30 minutes getting out of her road in the morning. It's not her fault. So there you are. Yeah. So, so we've gone. When I say we've come full circle, we have come from a service where it was pretty much open to everybody and affordable by everybody and. And you could get a free checkup uh, for everybody, even if you paid, you still got a free checkup. And uh, to a service where it's literally for people who've got no, no money, no choice, and increasingly no teeth. I think that's shocking. I think that should have been the headline. See that kestrel there flying over the roundabout? Amazing how they hover, isn't it? It's been going along with me. It's up there on that telegraph part on the uh, light post. <laughs> that beats hovering, doesn't it? Eh? Don't have to waste any energy sitting up there looking for worms. No, I think that's. Uh, I think that's shocking. I think that 51% um, of the people who take about, you know, use the National Health Service now are, are exempt. And of course, they're welcomed in by the dentist. The dentist loves. 
dentist NHS dentist love exemplary. Okay, I'll let you into another secret. NHS dentists love exam patients because basically they are so grateful to even find a dentist, to have some dentistry, to be able to tell their friends they've got an NHS dentist, that they are, do not question for one second anything the dentist tells them. The dentist can just get them in, set them down, and then say, right, you need X, Y, and Z, and do it. And the patient doesn't care because they're not paying for anything. The only stake they've got in the whole thing is the stake of their, their mouth. And they're being led to believe that the state of that's being improved. And, um, you know, they're, they're on the one hand, they've got this sort of Damocles hanging over them. So if the dentist says, no, I'm sorry, this tooth can't be root treated, it needs to be extracted for which the dentist gets paid exactly the same amount of money, you know, for like one-tenth of the amount of work and expenses. Uh, the, the exempt patient just says, fine, whatever, you know. And the dentist, dentist is happy. The patients are, have got some dentistry. And it's the, uh, the Department of Health takes some credit and um, everybody loses their teeth. Man, it's a crazy system, crazy. All right, I'll talk to you soon. Bye.